Welcome to the Building Healthy Organizations podcast. We understand how the human brain works and how that impacts behavior in the workplace. I'm glad you joined us today for our continued journey to understand how to build a healthy organization. As we enter into the last month of the year, it's a time for reflection. It's a time for planning for the year to come. But how do you prepare for uncertain times? Economic uncertainty, political uncertainty, public health uncertainty, employment uncertainty, energy uncertainty. You're probably ready for me to be done with the uncertainties, aren't you? There's a myriad of those out there. And the list just goes on and on. These are things on everybody's mind. And that's a challenge in itself. When these things are on people's minds, no matter who you are, no matter what your role is or your situation in life, these things will impact various parts of your life. And one of the key parts is decision-making. Our decision-making has an emotional component. So before you just discount that statement, think of times when you've had a variety of options that appear similar to get the same result. How do you choose which option? You probably choose the option that you feel best about. And I emphasize the word feel. Feelings are emotions. And there is a process that goes on in our brain where the rational and the emotional come together to help us make our best decisions. So what happens to your decision-making capability when uncertainty generates strong emotions? Emotions like anger or fear or anxiety or frustration. Well, what research tells us is that these strong emotions have a direct impact on our ability to make our best decisions. And it's not a good impact. It's a negative impact. When stress increases, our ability to access our higher cognitive functions decreases. I'm going to say that again. When stress increases, our ability to access our higher cognitive functions decreases. Critical thinking, problem solving, abstract reasoning, verbal reasoning, all of these are part of our higher cognitive abilities that are negatively impacted under stress, and directly so. Uh, it, there's a correlation between how much stress and how much those things are negatively impacted. We know from recent studies that emotional distress in the United States is up 300%, and that's across the board. That's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. Decision-making is critical to making good plans and preparing for the future. There's a cascade effect to decision-making. And let me try to describe that. I'd love to show you the chart, but it's a little hard to do that on an audio. Think of it this way. The first box the, where you start is insights, information, experience, the things that you know. The next step, the next box in this cascade effect is decisions. How we make our decisions from what we know. And from those decisions comes the next step, which is the actions that we take. And from that comes the last step, which is the results. Now, there's an interesting sidelight to this. If you go back up to decisions, decision-making, emotions directly impact decision-making for the good or for the bad. They work both ways. And so there's a very significant emotional component in decision-making. That is the critical element in this cascade 
that will determine the results and the outcomes that you get. Good decisions tend to lead to good actions and usually good results. Flawed decisions tend to lead to misaligned or inappropriate actions, and those generally lead to poor results. Notice that the emotions that are impacting the decisions they really are a natural part of the decision-making process. The key to making your very best decisions consistently is learning the emotional intelligence skill called navigating emotions, repurposing the energy and information you get from an emotion to get a better strategic outcome. That's what navigating emotions is all about. You don't want to remove emotions from the process. Studies have shown that the best decisions are a mix of the rational and the emotional. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. We we need the rational data to really focus in on the specifics. But then we need some way to judge, to guide us when it comes to which way to go, how do we create the right decision, and that's where the emotional component comes in. In essence, it is using your whole brain to make your best decisions. So why am I talking so much about decision making in this whole concept of how do we prepare for uncertainty? Well, because it's foundational to making our best decisions to making our best plans and preparing the best way that we can. Uncertainty by its very nature is something that is going to impact all of us. How much we let it impact us is something we do have control over. We started this conversation by talking about all the uncertainty in the world today So again, how do you prepare? How do you plan with all that uncertainty out there? Well, here's where it starts. Start with self-awareness. Do a bit of a self-assessment or a self-reflection. Where are you right now? Are you in a healthy state of mind? Are your emotions in a good place? Do you have the resources and the focus that you need to make your best decisions And what can you control? This is a good place to level set and put yourself in the best possible mindset for making the decisions and plans, preparations that you need to succeed in the year to come. Circumstances will never be perfect. As a matter of fact, perfect is the enemy of good. You need to be in a good place to make your best decisions and prepare in the best way possible. Once you're in a good place, make a list of the things that you do control, things that you can directly impact or leverage to generate the results that you desire. I want to share a story with you. And this is a true story. Recently, I was running a workshop with a group of leaders. I asked them the question, how do you plan for the unknown or for the uncertain? So these are high-level leaders. They came up with all kinds of ideas. They started responding. They created a long list of things they would consider. I then asked them, take that list and categorize it and place each item on that list into one of two buckets. Are they contingencies or are they proactive approaches? It took a minute for them to really realize what I meant by that, but as it sank in, I think they did a really good job of doing that. What happened was the vast majority of the items on that list became contingencies. Things that, well, if this happens, then we'll do that. Um, And there were probably more than three-quarters of the list 
were focused on contingencies. Then I asked them to place a probability percentage on each of those items in that contingency bucket. Meaning, how likely was each of those to actually happen? This is when they began to see the problem in trying to create contingencies for every possibility. Very few of the contingencies had any high percentage ratings. They were all fairly low. The emotions in the room were a bit on the negative side as they worked through this part of the exercise. They were frustrated. There was some anxiety. And I noticed even a little bit of apprehension, maybe even fear in some of the people as they were thinking about the things that could go wrong. And and you could see the negative emotions start to surface in that process. And something very interesting happened. The ability to collaborate and innovate in that group really diminished during that time frame. Okay, then I asked them to shift their mindset to only things they could proactively do to have the best year possible next year. The planning process became something very different at that point. They started to focus in on what they could do, what they could control. And something very interesting happened as they were making this switch to a more proactive mindset, the emotions in the room became much more positive. They started to collaborate better, to innovate more, to come up with actionable plans that brought real value. The difference was between trying to plan for the unknown or the uncertain in all its possible forms or planning for things they actually could control. So what do we control? Probably more than you think. We control individual and team development. We can help develop people. We control an agile resource allocation process. What do I mean by that? How good are we at at moving resources around where they're most needed? where they'll be most beneficial, bring the most value. Engagement and effort are things we control. We can do things to enhance engagement, to enhance effort from people. Also, we control connection and collaboration. How how often do we connect? How often and how well do we collaborate? And you can design processes and programs to do that at a higher level. We can control celebrating wins and and learning from mistakes. We can create a culture where that's important, where psychological safety is a key element that allows people to speak up and allows innovation to happen. And we also control the ability to create a resilient and a vital climate in our team and in our organizations. We do control that. We can choose to create an environment where people can be more resilient, can generate more energy. That's what I mean. Vitality is that that health and that energy that people and teams have. And, and how do we generate that? Shared purpose, shared values, uh, a sense of purpose, a sense of understanding, setting good expectations, having clear metrics, you know, the entire success pathway that we've talked about in the past. Notice that all of these things I've talked about related to what we can control focus on people. People are the most critical asset any organization has. I've seen teams rise up and overcome almost impossible challenges. I've seen leaders emerge from unexpected places. How does this happen? Let me share something I heard from a good friend and business owner. He has a very simple but profound growth strategy. 
prepare, then grow. That's it. That is the totality of his growth strategy. And it works. And it works really, really well. How can you grow in uncertain times? Well, you prepare and then you grow. I use a little different terminology, but it pretty much means the same thing. We equip people so they can prosper. When people prosper, growth is a natural outcome. But to prosper, they must be equipped to prosper. When you're making your decisions and you're making plans, you're preparing for the future. Remember that your greatest impact will be on the things within your control. If you want to succeed, you must prepare and grow yourself first. If you want your team to succeed, the same thing needs to happen for your team. If you want your organization to succeed, It's the same pathway. How do we equip people to prosper? By equipping them from the inside out. Let me explain what I mean by that. Real change, transformational change. Equipping people for the long term. Not short term fixes, but long term transformation comes from the inside and works its way out. We don't know for sure what tomorrow will bring, much less Q3 or Q4 of next year. If you want to take uncertainty out of your preparation process, out of your planning process, then prepare yourself and prepare your people for whatever comes next. That's a big step in the right direction. One of the most often missed opportunities is the opportunity to consistently grow and develop people in a way that adds agility and resilience, which is going to lead to greater capacity, greater competency, and greater character. Here are five steps you can take to build a proactive plan for success for next year. Number one, assess where each person is right now. That's what we talked about earlier in that self-awareness. Assess where everyone is right now. Second step, create a specific success pathway for each person. And in previous episodes, you'll find the success pathway defined uh, more specifically. But it is very simply put, help a people to understand what the expectations are very clearly and, I, and understanding, they understanding those expectations is critical to that. And help them to understand why those expectations are in place and how they impact the overall effort and others in their work effort. Have really good, clear measures and metrics, very visible measures and metrics. Make sure the consequences are clear. And consequences can be rewards or they can be redirections. And make sure that everyone understands the culture. What what is accepted behavior? What is accepted uh, activities? What are the rules in our culture that we live by? And when people start to create for themselves a true understanding of a success pathway, then they can move faster with less fear, less anxiety. And this takes us back to what we talked about earlier. When your people are making decisions, do you think they may have similar levels of stress and emotions that you do? Well, of course they do. And so they're being impacted in their decision-making process, just like you are. The more we can free people up, provide a clear success pathway, and put up really good guardrails 
so they can run faster in their lane, everybody's going to be happier. Everybody's going to be more productive and more successful. Step number three, equip each person. Skills, hard skills, human skills, emotional intelligence skills. Bottom line, the most important skill set that you can learn the fastest and really grow the fastest right now is emotional intelligence. How do we deal with all the uncertainty and the emotions that are generated from all of these unknowns and all of this, this what if this happens or what if that happens? The way we deal with those emotions is to learn how to navigate them better. And the other competencies of emotional intelligence that help us to lead ourselves better so that we can lead other people better, lead other efforts better. And everybody's a leader. Everybody needs to learn how to lead themselves well. And then they can be a leader to other people, even if it's just by example. Leadership is not an authoritarian role. It is not something you achieve by reaching a certain level in the corporate ladder or the organizational ladder. It is, it's from the inside out. It is a display of leadership that comes from leading yourself well. We need to remember as a part of step three in equipping each person, this should be a consistent process, a deliberately developmental focus. I take that out of a, a great book by Keegan Alehi, An Everyone Culture. If we commit to an ongoing priority of development, growth, and learning, we're going to live and work in an organization that we like, that we like a lot. It's the other side of things that really create the problems. When people are not learning, not growing, that creates all kinds of issues. Step number four, initiate weekly coaching. Just where you sit down with your people, talk to them on a weekly basis, or if it's you and you're, you're by yourself, you need some reflection time. Sit down and talk to yourself. Sit down and and have those times when you can reflect, when you can think about what's going on. If you're a leader of people, you have people that report to you, then you need to be there for them. There is no professional athlete I know of that does not have a coach, at least one coach. And if you're a leader in an organization of any kind, I don't care if it's one person you're leading or a hundred, if you're a leader in an organization, you have a right and a responsibility to help coach your people. You may disagree with that, and that's fine. Feel free to disagree. But you will get more engagement, more productivity, and frankly, a better workplace and a better environment if you will do that. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the future. Number five, enhance opportunities for connection, collaboration, and innovation, especially now in our world of remote work. You need to literally schedule times for connection, collaboration, and innovation. There needs to be far more emphasis put on those design times where we get together and we do these things. And the more you can get in-person time, the better. That's the five steps you can take right now to start removing uncertainty and preparing yourself and your people for whatever comes next. This is the proactive approach. It builds emotional courage, which is critical to making best decisions no matter what role you are in the organization. It removes roadblocks. It empowers people. It generates the energy and the motivation that's needed to meet the next set of challenges, to take advantage of the next opportunity that comes along. And it promotes a healthy and a vital organization. 
Are you worried about which piece of the sky is going to fall next? Or are you building a rocket ship that will lift you and your team to new heights? I know which one I would choose. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Building Healthy Organizations by EQ Fit. We do understand how the human brain works and how that impacts behavior and performance in the workplace. We also love hearing your suggestions and ideas. If you have a topic you'd like us to cover, please send us an email at info at gscfit.com. For more information and inspiration, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course our website, eqfit.org.